All right, this is chapter 10, a very long chapter, so we're going to go through it kind of quickly. And there is an assignment on this one as well. I did post it. Uh, unlike chapter 9. Okay, let's continue. All right, this is about controls, and uh, one large portion of it is access controls. Identification, authentication, accountability, authorization. We're going to talk about each one of those. First of all, identification. You all know there's an issue with our Oklahoma driver's licenses. Uh, is it something about the ID, or right. is it not the ID being like the stamps? Well, the real ID act basically says our suck. And, uh, you know, when I, I'm originally from Connecticut, okay? And the way it works in Connecticut, you go to the DMV, you pass the test, and you get a driver's license at the DMV. You don't go to a vacuum cleaner store and pick up a driver's license. Yes, I literally went to a vacuum cleaner place, which was a tag agency. What kind of security do you think is involved in that? Yeah. So, yeah, we do have to have ours fixed, and I guess we have another year to do it, but it's crazy. But it says, uh, unverified entity is also called a supplicant. In other words, you, someone supplied, but they don't know who they are yet. We ID is probably the easiest thing. We, we have student ID, we have military IDs, we have state IDs, we have passports, just... Now, something so we can see who you are, okay? And a lot of them can be forged, okay? You tell this thing. Sit down. It's always nice. It's the, yeah, yeah, I know that first. There we go. Now it's lower. Okay. Now, um, it says four types of authentication mechanisms. Something you know, which could be personal information, uh, something you have, it could be, you know, our ID, something you are, it could be biometric, something like that, or something you can produce, you could talk, you could do all kinds of stuff. Um, now, it would be nice if we did all four things, but we usually do two, okay? And, you know, the bottom bullet there, they talk about ATMs. Requires a bank card, so it's something you have and something you know, which would be your PIN number. Um, it always gets me, I mean, that's a four-digit number. It's not very big, you know? So, I don't know. I try not to use my debit card very much at all. Hopefully, none of you use it to buy stuff at a store. If you use it, use it as a credit card. Yes. Y'all know that? Yeah. You don't use it as a debit card? Because if you use a debit card and someone gets it, they have access to all your funds. If you use it as a credit card and someone gets it, you're, ac you're liable for nothing. So, you should never use it as a debit card unless you're like, at an ATM, just getting money out. That's the only time you use a debit card. Now, why do you think the banks want to use, or the stores want you to use this debit card? Anybody know? They get a fee. They, get a fee. they don't. They don't pay a fee if you use this debit card. They pay a fee if you use this credit card. That's why I always have to hit the cancel or the whatever. Or just. Uh, so have to go debit first. That's right. Enter your PIN. No, I don't want to enter my PIN. So yeah, that's why they do it that way. Okay. Uh, passwords. We know what passwords are. Yeah. Uh, password, this is secret word or combination of characters. It's just crazy the way you, you know, I did, I had to fill out an account yesterday, and the username had to be 8 to 10 characters long. The password had to be 9 to 12. I'm like, that's weird. It was, why, why is it the other way around? I, it, was, it, was, it was just weird. Um, but passwords, you know, suck. Most of them suck. Um, a lot of people reuse them, and we're all guilty of that, because we use one, and y'all, I was actually over at my friend's house yesterday, we were actually talking about passwords, and we had, we were joking about this one password that we both use of mine, that I have from the military. We're about talking back in the mid to early 90s. I don't use it for much anymore, but... Uh, yeah, okay. Uh, passphrase is a plain language phrase from a virtual key or virtual password is derived. So what they're talking about there is I used to have to open a little mailbox that you, know, you had to put a little, had to do the dial like a code on it. and But it was all letters instead of numbers. So what I did is I made a sentence where each first letter was like, you know, you know, everybody likes dog, whatever. It was just some stupid phrase that made up the letter. That's kind of what we're talking about here. Come up with a phrase, and maybe the first letters would be parts of it, okay? Or some unique code. This is a password memory support software application. Does anyone use any password 
management tools here? LastPass. Last pass. You can think about it. LastPass is my favorite, although they just got bought out by Log Me In, which I'm not a fan of. But there's really nothing better out there. That's still the best one out there. So LastPass, good, but there are lots of other ones out there. Yeah. But it's at the point where you have to have something because you can't remember them all. I have too many sites. Everything needs a login nowadays. Everything. All right, here's eWallet from whatever, from Illum, where you can memorize you know, and remember your stuff. So there's lots of them out there. Okay, something you have. It could be a dumb card. It could be a smart card. It could be a token could be a synchronous token. Um, I remember when I used to work at the Oklahoma Tower taking care of an insurance company up on the 34th floor. I had a smart card. Basically, it was a card that I would just put up against the proximity sensor and it let me in. Kind of like RFID kind of stuff. And uh, it was nice because I could just leave it in my wallet. And even if my hands are full, just turn around and push my butt up against the sensor and it would unlock the door for me. So it was kind of handy. Okay. Uh, smart cards are getting more popular. Um, I'm assuming our student IDs will go to those before too long. They're supposed to be going to replace them, at least an RFID chip here shortly. Because if you notice on the outside of our doors, we got those locks now. They're supposed to be used for that. Do we have any strips? Do we have any strips on our ID? I thought it was yeah, we have a strip. We have a strip. Yeah. Because I actually have a reader in my office. So. Oh, okay. Okay. Could be a token synchronized with the server. Uh, RSA token. A lot of people have those, and they work pretty good. It's kind of a lot along the same lines as two-factor authentication, which we're actually going to talk about here in a minute. Okay. Or something you are. Could be your fingerprints, could be an e-card, could be facial recognition. I was logging into my uh, friend's, um, uh, what you call it, uh, Surface Pro 4 yesterday, uh -huh. and he uses his face. What I'm wondering, though, is it's supposed to be the geometry of your face. What if you shave? Does that make a difference? It shouldn't. I was just wondering, I know. But it uh, could be your hand, it could be your retina how, scan, it could be on how thick the beard. But if it's really just going by your eyes, your nose, and your mouth location, it shouldn't matter. But I guess if your beard was to grow over your mouth, well, then you have an issue. <laughs> no, well, okay. I don't think I've ever uh, seen a beard grow. Voice recognition. We actually watched the movie uh, Sneakers the other day. Robert Redford movie. If you haven't seen it, you need to watch it. Really good movie. And on one part in there, there's a man trap where they go in. And it was voice recognition. You had to, you know, my voice is my passport to authenticate me, they had to say. Because, you know, voice is a big deal. And, you know, I'm really impressed. Like, Siri on my iPhone is getting really, really good. Yeah. Y'all remember Star Trek IV, Voyage Home, the best Star Trek yeah. movie ever, where Scotty's out there and he's trying to build these cages to hold the dolphins, oh, the whales. And he's like, he picks up the mouse, computer. <laughs> Oh, how quaint. I will type it in. You know, it was pretty funny. But that's happening. You know, the only drawback I see is if I'm sitting there, like, say I want to, before class I come in here and I want to log into a website, I don't want to be having to say it out loud where y'all can hear it. Like, you know, uh, navigate to Google. You know, that kind of stuff. So, but, yeah. But it's getting there. It's so awkward when you're out in public and you have to voice talk to something. Exactly. But it is nice, like my watch, it's just, it works most of the time, and it's very, very accurate, yes. It really depends on the application, because, um, you know how Xbox, the uh, the Kinect now is voice right. recognition? Yes. People have actually figured out ways, like they'll go into online games with a um, voice chat. Right. And they'll actually, like, they'll name themselves something like Xbox Shut Off or something Oh, like nice, that. yes, I've heard that, yes. Do something annoying, so other people's mm -hmm. like, Xbox Shut Off, and it'll actually shut their Xbox. There was an Xbox commercial that was turning them on. You say Xbox on, and there was a commercial demonstrating that. And so people well, would, would come on their TV, their Kinect would pick it up, and it would turn their Xbox on. Well, I was in a, I wasn't, I was watching the uh, keynote from my, from Apple's last one had, which the keynote sucked. But <laughs> on there he said, hey Siri, and basically it, it woke up <laughs> a lot of people's phones. It was pretty funny, but uh, yeah, I've had that a problem a lot with mine. I'll say something in my, what may I help you with? I'm like, oh, sorry, I didn't even say that, but okay. Now, here's an example of fingerprints, you know, handprints, facial recognition, and they are getting better. Now, you watch some TV shows. What? Are we using dental yet? Has it gotten They actually do dental, but that's mainly for death. Like, you died, and they want to recognize your body, they go get your dental prints. Uh, 
But um, you watch on the TV show, and they're always trying to do facial recognition, and it's always zooming by on the screen. First of all, it doesn't zoom by on the screen. Why would it? That'd be stupid. Uh, but it doesn't work quite that way, but it is getting better. It's getting much, much better. Okay. Uh, evaluating them, uh, reject rate. Um, Eileen, fingerprints suck. She has very, very low fingerprints. So it would take her forever to just get her fingerprints for a driver's license because it, it was bad. And there's also the possibility that people, your fingerprint is so heavy that someone could just easily lightly put their exactly. finger on it. And my son did that. I had a, uh, a fingerprint reader. I think it was the Microsoft brand years ago. And my son literally walks up to it with a piece of white paper, pushes on it, lets them in. Because it had my fingerprint on the page. So it was pretty bad. Uh, false accept rate. So it says re percentage of authorized users who are denied access, which I'm okay with that. The false accept rate, that's the bad one. Now I'm letting people in that aren't really the person. Okay. Crossover errors is the point at which the number of rejects uh, equals the number of false, you know. So it's neither good, but you're always going to have issues. Um, retina. You know, I, we had, we actually, it's probably still upstairs somewhere. We had a, uh, I don't know if it was an iris or a retina scanner upstairs, just like a $400 one. And I could enroll my eye in it, but I could never authenticate with it. would never do it. I tried it a I don't know why, it just never works, so we never did much with it, but fingerprints are tough. I mean, you really need to buy something expensive if you want this stuff to work. Now, I'm impressed the Touch ID on my phone actually works very well. So, now, Android has something similar, but it's, it's not nearly as good. It can't be. It's Android. It looks pretty good. No, it can't be as good. <laughs> Keystroke. Um, I'll have to find that website, but I actually had a little project. Uh, I, I'll find it, uh, where it recognizes your keystroke, and it's very cool, because you type something, and you don't realize it, but, okay, starting next semester, you guys are going to have to get proctored exams. Sorry about that, but you'll be able to do it at home. But the uh, a nice thing about it, there's a section on there where they recognize you via your keystrokes, and it, it's really, really good. Uh, I'll, I'll demo it to you all. But it's, it's really cool. And signature recognition? So we can finally figure it out if you're hunting, hunting pecking. Yeah, because it does, but, you know, did you ever watch someone type? I mean, words they know they can type very fast. And unless you suck at everything, then you just hunt back everything. But there is a pattern in the way you type, okay? Keystroke pattern. When I was up at University of Tulsa, some girl was actually doing research in that. She, brought, she would bring a laptop over and you would type something just to record different typing patterns on there. Okay, so kind of cool stuff. Authorization could be handled one of three ways. Authorization for each user, authorization for a member of a group, or across multiple systems. Now, I can log in here, but I still have to log in into my office, so it's different systems. I mean, different computers, but into the same system. But once I log in, my credentials go across multiple systems. I can check my email. But then I have to log in again to go into PeopleSoft and log in again to go into D2L. So it's not fully integrated here, but it's somewhat integrated. Okay. All right. So accountability. Who did what? You know. It says ensures that all actions on the system can be attributed to an authenticated identity. Kind of important. Who deleted that file? Who did whatever? You know, very, very important. And logs. You know, I saw a demo last week from this guy in... That was amazing. He, sh he would basically, right in front of me, did a SQL injection attack. He did another one where he got right into a fully patched server, 2012 server. And I'm like, you got to be kidding me. Uh, it was really amazing. And one of the things he showed is he even went in, and when he was done, he wiped out all the system logs. So even if you had captured him, you know, it's like, oh, all the evidence is now gone. It's, it's just pretty amazing stuff. I mean, like the car hack. I like there's a... No, cars now don't even, cars don't even have system logs, do they? Like oh, actually, they have more logs now than ever. I was actually, okay. I'm going back in May to a conference, but I went through last year. Cars now keep track of everything. They know when your blinker's on. They know when someone's sitting in the seat. They know when your seatbelt's on. They know when the radio volume is being adjusted. They know everything. When your headlights, when the turn, everything. And 
there's actually three different buses. I can't remember what they are. It's like the, the high priority bus is like the braking system and the steering system. Then you got the low priority bus, which is like the logging system. But it does. It keeps track of everything. So you can go back and see where the light's on during that accident, you know, right before the accident. Did they have their blinkers on? Or, you know, so it's. Like there was a hack or something where they actually took control of the car. I saw where they took control of the Prius, yeah. yes. Did I they saw have that. logs then? Oh, they have logs then, yes. Uh, pretty much everything logs, and even if it's not for accountability reasons, a lot of times it's for error checking reasons. Hey, something ha like you know they're actually finally implementing prerequisite checking in PeopleSoft. Believe it or not, it's just being turned on now, and they're trying to fix the bugs in it because some of them aren't set right. So they told Steve, "Don't override the error; <laughs> just report it so we can find out what's causing it." Cause it is it's tough but yeah logging big deal and logs get huge i mean my when i ran my isp years ago i was a very 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 small isp but i still had you know quite a few email accounts but my mail logs alone were about 500 megs a day of strictly text that's a lot of text so all right log generation you could have multiple log sor sources you could have one log source you could all kinds of different ways to do it they said inconsistent log content is bad. You would want you don't want to have logs that record erroneous information. Okay, down at the bottom they talk about log parsing, going through logs or event filtering. I want to see when someone logged on, or I want to see when someone logged off, or I can see when someone did whatever, or event aggregation. I want to put it all together. You know, maybe you know Ken access ten machines on campus. You know, I want to see all of his stuff together. So I want to put it all together. Okay. Uh, it says log analysis and storage and transfers of logs data to an anal analyzing system. You cannot look at that stuff by hand. It would take you forever. Okay. And when I was in Dallas, this guy demoed some software too. It's called OmniPeak, I think. Uh, awesome software. It's like, y'all know what Wireshark is. Yeah. It's like Wireshark on steroids. It does it, but it gives so much more information. Like you can see a graphical view of the traffic. So you could see in the timeline exactly when all the traffic. Ooh, there's a big spike at 9 a.m. You could click on it and drill right down and see exactly what it is rather than look at. I mean, Wireshark is very daunting. If you have gigs of data to scroll through, sucks. Okay. Log rotation. You know, when I had my mail server, every 30 days I would overwrite the logs. I didn't have enough storage space to keep more than that. And the funny thing is, there's no law saying how long I have to keep it. No one specifies that. So, uh, log archive, how long do you keep it? You know, how long do I archive it? Do I compress it? Okay. Do I reduce it? Do I keep certain parts of it? And when I did my logging, you know, when I had an issue, I would turn on advanced logging. So, record massive amounts of stuff. But then when everything's working fine, I turn on low, you know, lower logging, so I really just get the basics. And then log convert it. Uh, uh, I think I talked to you in this class already, but when uh, Sergeant Grit converted from one piece of software to another, you know, the, the, it was written into the contract that the new company would do the conversion. They were very pissed about that, <laughs> but they had to do it. But converting logs is another story there as well. Okay. All right. Uh, normalization, integrity. I mean, are the logs good? Okay. Are duplicates removed? That kind of stuff. Okay. Event correlation. You know, log reviewing. Log. Re now that you got these logs, what do you do? I mean, if you're going to keep logs that don't ever look at them or don't ever review them, what good is that? When I uh, had to do a PCI compliance check, one of the questions was, do on the firewall, do you monitor the, C the CPU utilization every 15 seconds? How could you do that? You You'd have to do it with software. You couldn't. I mean. As a human being, you could not look at something every 15 seconds, 24-7. You couldn't. You just couldn't do it. So uh, it has to be done through some sort of automated means. Then disposal and clearing. Do you ever dump the logs? Because when I worked at the network shop at Tinker, they came to me one day and says, oh, we want to know um, the downtime of a Windows server. And back then, there was none. I mean, Linux, you could see uptime. Windows, there was nothing. So I said, not a problem. All we really need to look at is uh, logs entry 605 and 609. That's a reboot. Okay, We can look at those to so know how many times the server was restarted at least. 
and figure, you know, it was probably down for five minutes for the restart, so then we could calculate the uptime. So we went in there, and I said, okay, show me your logs. And they're like, oh, we dump them every morning because they get full. I'm like, what? <laughs> so no, I cannot give you that information. If you dump the logs every day, it's worthless, okay? So log disposal, log clearing, you know, be careful with that, especially if, what was it, the OPM breach? They said someone was in their systems a year and a half to two years prior to when the breach was detected. That's crazy. And this guy did a demo for us. He was showing that a lot of times you really only get notified of the issue when something major happens, but they were probably in there a long time beforehand. So think about it, okay? So I got an alarm in my house. If you open certain doors, the alarm goes off instantly, and other doors it takes a minute. But what if you're casing my house for two days or a month or a week or and looking at all my windows? Is that going to set the alarm off? No. I don't have motion sensors outside my house. So I'm not going to know how long you... Actually, I do have them. I do. That's true, I do. I have a couple cameras that do alert me on motion. But my point is you don't always know, so you want to keep all that stuff. So it's, it's just tough. Okay. All right. All right, general suggestion says make sure data source can handle the amount of data generated by the logs because they get huge. Rotate them when you have nowhere else to put them or when you run out of space. Archive them if you can. Keep a copy. How long should you keep a copy? Well, I don't know. Secure them. If it's a secure system, obviously the logs need to be, you know, it's kind of like with backups. If I have a top secret system and I back up the data, what's the data classification of the backup? should be top secret because it contains the data from the machine. So a lot of people don't think of that. Your classification of your data and of your logs should be consistent with what's on the machine. Because okay? i got a top secret system here and I do something that causes a system error to be generated. That system error could technically include some of the information. Ken was typing this when it crashed. So, you know, so they need to be secure, need to be destroyed correctly. There are a lot of ways to do that too. Okay. Access control policies is specifies how access rights are granted. So if, uh, you know, if I was to call over to IT services right now and say, hey, I need access to the uh, Pluto server. We have, I think a lot of ours are named after planets. You think they give it to me? They might. They might well, say, oh, this is Ken Dewey. He them. might need, I mean, if I said I, if I could come up with some reason, hey, I need to be able to write to this file. But if you were to call, probably not. So hopefully they have something in place for that. Okay. Right. So this must include a periodic review. Uh, do we look at that stuff? I'm, you know, I was notorious. I don't believe in, okay, I don't like to delete user accounts. Reason was, when I was in the military, we had this commander that was leaving. Obviously, commander leaves, what happens? You get a new commander. So someone went in there and said, oh, this commander's leaving, delete account. Now we're going to add this new commander, but it'd be very hard to set up, I mean, obviously the commander's going to take the position, same role, so you think, you know, it should have the same permissions, but now they deleted him first. I'm like, idiot, <laughs> you should have copied or renamed or something. That way you could at least have the same settings on there. So I'm a big fan of disabling an account. That way when you replace the position, you just got to reno you got to remember to go back and delete the account after a while. Okay, grant access rights to new employees. Uh, we have a login template here. When you hire someone, you have to go in and fill this out. What rights do they need? Do they need access to email and that kind of stuff? Or changing access rights. You know, Bob is moving from position A to position B. Does he need different roles now? Okay. Revoking rights as appropriate. Uh, you know, now Bob is moving from B to C. Now he needs different roles. Are you pulling away some rights? That kind of stuff. It says, without it, administrators may implement access controls in a way that are inconsistent with your philosophy. I remember way back when we first started this whole computer stuff. Back in the mid '90s, when it started to get popular, there was really no role, no rules. You just did it to make it work. Probably not the best plan. <laughs> firewalls help protect us. A firewall is a device that prevents a specific type of information from moving between the outside world and the inside world. Untrusted to trusted. It can be a separate system. 
It can be a service running in a router. It can be all kinds of different ways. We're going to talk about a bunch of them. To develop your firewall, says packet filtering firewall. Simple. The easiest way to set one, it literally just filters based on packets. Looks at a packet coming in, decides if it should come in or not. Says can filter based on IP address, packet, port, request, or whatever. It's the real, it's the most basic type. Application level, it says, uh, often consistent with dedicated computers. Really now we're looking at the application layer of what they are actually doing. Okay. All right. Demilitarize them. We'll see a picture of it in a minute. Maybe I have a, like we have an email server here. It's behind a firewall, so some traffic is allowed through the firewall into the email server, into the demilitarized zone. That way, so it's gone through some filtering, but some stuff is still being allowed through. Okay, so an intermediate area. We also could have a caching server. Um, years ago, way back before high-speed internet, back when we had modems, I'm assuming none of you had internet back then. But uh, even at the current house where I'm living, I had two phone lines, 386-1218 uh, and 1219. I don't know why I still remember them, but uh, I had two phone lines, and I had a modem on each, and I bonded them together. So basically, I dialed out on two modems to make my traffic faster. And it worked really good. But I went through a caching proxy server, which would, you know, it would it was nice because it would remember stuff that you did, you know, and remember images that were on the web so you didn't have to reload them a second time. But it would actually go out and get content that you got on a regular basis. It was funny one day because I used to read Dilbert every morning. And... One morning I went, I read Dilbert, no problem, but nothing else would work. I'm like, what the heck? And I found out it's been off for quite a while. But turns out the modems had gone out since it was a cache. It was set up to go out and retrieve Dilbert. So it was already there. So I really wasn't watching it live. I was reading when it got earlier. But yeah, it says a proxy server application that stores recently accessed information. Not used as much anymore. They were used a lot way back when because we had slow internet. We had a you know, our bandwidth was very limited, but now we have virtually unlimited bandwidth. Depends where you live. My friend of mine doesn't, but most of us do. Okay. Stateful inspection keeps track of each network connection between an internal and an external using a state table. So I go to Google and I ask for information so the request from Google can come back. Okay. It's not going to let a request from Google come in that didn't initiate on the inside. Okay says it tracks the context of each exchange of packets so it knows you know in other words before a packet could come in there had to be a request for that packet i had to ask for it in other words i had to make a request for it okay a dynamic packet filtering so it allows only a particular packet with a specific source destination port address so you know it can change you know, they can be updated we're only looking for stuff from a certain location okay Unify Threat Management, it's a system of a bunch of stuff put together. Okay, could be a stateful packet inspection, could be an intrusion detection system, could be a content filter, could be malware. All this stuff is put together. I actually got an email this morning from our IT services saying, hey, do not click on this email. I got the email Saturday. Obviously, I know better than to click on it. But the uh, point was, got the email Saturday. He sends the email out this morning saying, don't click on it. You see a problem with that? Exactly. Why didn't we get it to begin with? Our filter is not working right. But, you know, that's beyond me. And I was actually at my friend's house trying to fix his Surface Pro 4 and get a... Okay, I'm very weary about clicking on stuff on a, in a Windows computer because there's so many viruses out there. And I need to download a driver update. And, you know, there's so many places that, oh, I got every driver you want. Just click here. I was very weary. I wouldn't do it. I said, no, I really don't feel comfortable clicking on these links. So I just sent them over to the Microsoft store to fix it. So it was, it was weird. He had a Surface Pro 4. When you, he totally resets it. And everything works fine. He does the Windows update, which is kind of mandatory on that. And he loses his sound card totally. You revert back to the brand new and it works fine. You do the update again. Totally removes the sound. Went to Microsoft and the, sure enough, it's an issue with their update. So... They had to Why do, do they not have the update? Yeah, not, I mean, you would think something like a Surface Pro would be pretty standardized. And yeah, it's and from Microsoft. Said, yeah. Microsoft product. You think of update from Microsoft 
for a Microsoft product it's should work. Windows 10 is automatic exactly, that's what he had. It's, it's messed up so yeah. well, if you break something. So yeah. he uh, he went there and he took him a couple hours, but yeah, they I guess they were pushing out a new update right as he was there, to because it was such an issue with this update causing all these sound cards. It's not that the sound card didn't work anymore. Sound card was missing. I mean, it didn't show up with an error. It literally is like you have no sound card. It's like, what do you mean you don't have a sound card? At least if it was there was an error, you could say, oh, I can fix update to no. It's like you have no sound card. He's like. What? <laughs> so it was, it was crazy, but okay. All right. So uh, firewall application says um, we have packet filtering, we have screen host. We're going to talk about each one of these: dual host and screen subnet. Packet filtering, kind of like I talked about it already. Simple but effective means of lowering the risk. Only let certain packets through. Easy enough there. Okay. Screen host combine the packet filtering with a separate dedicated firewall, such as a proxy server. Now they here they talk about a bastion host which is like a proxy server. What a proxy server is, is they actually use quite frequent. Tinker uses them. We have one here for a few things. But say I want to get something from Microsoft or from anywhere on the Internet. I don't go get it. I ask the proxy server. Then the proxy server goes and gets it. Okay. The reason for that is I got my PC here on the desk and say I want to go get something from Google. Well, there could be a problem with it. Google could be sending me a virus or a link to a virus or something. But if I ask the proxy server to get it for me, then the proxy server goes and gets it from Google and then returns it to me. The proxy server can scan it, can look for viruses. It's probably a, a lot more robust system than this one on my desktop. So then the, a, a prime example is I was teaching a class for actually for Terry Byers when he worked at Meridian Technologies up in Stillwater. I was teaching a plus class. And I don't know what one of my students searched. But I think it had the word boobs in it. <laughs> and this is a public school system. Wow, that set off flat. I literally, within moments later, I had someone come in, who searched boobs? I'm like, <laughs> I, 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 I don't know. What happened was it was like a content filter. They looked at it and instantly set off all the flags because, whoa, someone searched the word boobs. And it turns out she just mistyped something. It was some female, but it was Maybe it was, was looking up birds. You know, it could be, but it was kind of funny. But that's what a a proxy could be used for. Hey, are they really looking for boobs? You know, <laughs> maybe we need to notify somebody. Okay, uh, like a tinker, they block all flash, so the proxy server could go out and get the. Re oh, this has flash content in it. Let's strip the flash off and return it without flash. That's what it's used for. Okay. Also referred to as the sacrificial host. So really, that one's the one that's going to get hit more often. Okay. Here's just some pictures of what we talked about. Dual home is a system with two network cards. One might be to the outside area. One might be to the inside area. Okay. So I have a system, kind of like a firewall, uh, where I have the external card and the internal card. That's what your router is at home, if you think about it. You have a cable modem that connects to your cable modem, then the other one connects to your internal network. Got two ho oh, you got two ports on there. Now, speaking of that, they have two different things here. Network address translation and port address translation. Let's talk about these two. Internal to row state, I'm gonna bring up this. I found this awesome program the other day. It's pretty cool. It's called Chrome. You uh, bring it up and it, it lets you surf this thing called the internet. Okay, I'm gonna go to IP chicken. There's also a bunch of other places. I just this one's easy to remember. IP chicken. What it does is it goes out and says, "What's my?" It gets my IP address, and it turns out my IP address is 164.58.104.12. Now, if I was to do that from any system on row state, guess what? I'd get the same address because we all serve the internet as one. So, what happened when I typed that address in? It went to our router. It said, "Hey, Ken Dewey's machine wants to go to IP chicken." So, the router then sent a packet to IP chicken. But it put an entry in the network address translation table and said this packet that went to IP Chicken belongs to Ken Dewey's machine. So then when the packet came back from IP Chicken, it says, okay, this response to that request goes back to Ken Dewey, so it sent it over to me. So this network address translation table gets very large and it's dynamic. Okay. Now port address translation 
does kind of the same thing, but can actually manipulate ports. Okay. So now we'll you know know of who asked for what, but what port was it asked for on? So with that being said, this is from my alarm system, my uh, my router this morning. So is this NAT, Pat, or what the heck is it? Well, I have an airport extreme, extreme, ex, extreme at home that when a packet comes in, in this example, from the outside on port 208, it translates it to port 80 internal and sends it to that internal address. So is that NAT or PAT? Is it network address translation or port address translation? Port. It's actually both. It is definitely doing the port. It's converting 208, so it says whenever a packet comes in for 208, convert it to 80. But it's also doing NAT because it's sending it to an internal address. If it was just port, it would say everything coming in on 208 always goes to 80 for everything. Well, it's not just doing that. It's sending it to a particular. This happens to be a camera that's offline, so you wouldn't be able to see it anyway. But... Um, so yeah, you can combine them. It can be done both at once. And that's why I love this router, because I can you know, have external addresses. Um, I have a sprinkler system. What I did is I scanned Rose's network to see what ports were open. So I'm, I set up a port translation in my router at home for all the different ports that Rose uses so I can connect all the different things on my home network. It's pretty <laughs> handy that way. <laughs> all right. You must use this power for I'm not hurting anything with it. Mm -hmm. I said, hey, you got port 505 open. Okay, I'm going to use it. I'll go through it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's not like I'm coming into Rosa. I'm going out on it. See, if I go out everything on port 80, well, then it's hard for my home system to determine which one to go where. I need a different ports. So, All right, so dual home firewall, same kind of thing. Two network cars. We have one on the outside, one on the inside. Okay. It says, Dual Home has advantage of NAT or PAT by preventing external attacks from reaching internal machines with addresses in specific ranges. Now, that specific port went to a specific machine on the inside, but it didn't go to every machine on the inside. It was really limited to a specific area. Okay. Disadvantages if a Dual Home host is compromised, it can take out the connections to the external traffic. Think about it. you got a, a router at your house, a Linksys or whatever the heck you got. If that thing gets compromised or killed, what happens to your traffic you're done i mean if it if that's your way in and out it's kind of like think of it like um your house say the only way in and out of your house was your front door front door breaks what happens you're either it lets all traffic through or no one can go through okay it says as traffic volume increases the dual home host can become overloaded okay uh we did a project with the uh, hping 3 it's a uh Packet manipulation problem. It's kind of like ping. You all know what ping is. Back at Internet Groper, it's used for checking connectivity. But HPing, you can really go crazy with it. And you can have it send out hundreds of thousands of packets a second to random addresses. We tried that with a Linksys router. No, no, it died instantly. Way too much traffic. It literally killed it. Because I set up this entire project. We went into the lab, the students. I said, only do it for 10 seconds, because it literally will send out 40,000 packets a second. I said, hit start, and then hit stop. And it, 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 I think two students did the same time, done, router's gone. I said, crap, had to restart it. So it could overload it. Okay. Uh, back when I ran my ISP, I had an older router, and I had one T1. Then I added two more, so I ended up having three T1s. My older router, the CPU was like, it was nearly maxed out at all times because it was too much for it. It couldn't handle all the traffic. So, all right. uh, Big advantage, providing strong protection with a minimal expense. Come on, our Linksys routers at our house do a pretty darn good job, and they're darn cheap. So, okay. All right, screen subnet firewall with DMZ because it's one of more internet uh, internal bastion hosts located behind. That's like the email server I told you about with each protecting the trusted network so we allow certain things through there, okay? So maybe an email or maybe we have a web server in there or we have certain stuff in there, okay? It can be a dedicated port on the firewall. It can be connected to the screens. It can be set up any way you want, and they show an example here. Maybe we have the outside network on the left, 
and we load certain things through, maybe our email, maybe our web server, and then we have another firewall going to the inside. So you really have to get through two firewalls to get in. Okay, so when evaluating a firewall, ask the questions. What type of technology offers the right balance, protection costs? How about the price? How about the configuration? I set up a, um, it begins with S, um, Speedstream? Is this, no. Forget, whatever. I've set up some really con hard to configure ones and some really easy, but they're, nowadays they're really quite simple to do. But the advanced configuration is where it gets tougher. Okay, we're just not, they don't go into depth on it here anywhere. Okay. It says, it can be hard to figure out how to configure. So, logic errors, I mean, rules. Some of the rules we use in our lab upstairs, we still to this day are complex. You know, we allow this specific port to go on this specific address to this specific host, and you really need to think out each one. Okay. Um, yeah, it's, it's just tough. Okay. So this reduces this proper rule sequence. When you look at it upstairs, we have a bunch of different rules. So what do you think the top rule should be? The first rule we hit should be the one with getting the most traffic. The one we're doing the most stuff on, we probably, say we're using vSphere the most. vSphere should be near the top. Say we use FTP the least. FTP should be at the bottom. So whichever, you know, the ordering of rules really helps as well. Okay. Because if every packet that came in, first thing we did is says, are you an FTP packet? Well, I do very few FTP packets, but I do a lot of vSphere. So why would we want to check every vSphere packet if it was an FTP packet first? We shouldn't. So so FTP would be slower, so we put it at the bottom. Okay. All right, limitations. is They are not creative and cannot make sense for human actions outside of their program. They only do what they're told. Okay. It, it can't do something it doesn't know about. Yeah, and uh, yeah, exactly. Because you know, my friend of mine that I was up helping yesterday, he has seven cameras internal. Well, he switched ISPs, and now they stopped working. Well, I went up there and tried to figure out what the issue was. Well, they had gone into his router and reconfigured it to um, bridge mode rather than router mode. Bridge mode means just let everything flow back and forth. It, it's not doing its function anymore. It's not a router at all. I'm like, why did they do that? I couldn't understand why they did it. And finally, I'm like, you know, this is stupid. So I put it back on the router mode. Ta-da, everything started working. I'm like, why did they do that? That was stupid. So, yeah, I mean, he still has to do one more. He has to get a... Why they did that? Or is it still mystery? Well, it, uh, they, a lot of times, you know, a prime example is I used to take care of a company called Nancy Berlin Public Relations. Okay, She hired Cox to put in their internet. They are hired to come in and put in your net to make it work. Are they there to make sure you're secure and you're no, they're there to put in your internet. So that's what these people did. They just put in the internet and the guy says, Oh, you we're putting a router for you up in the attic, so we're gonna bypass your router. No. Our router is there because how do I even know how their router is configured? I don't. I don't know what the hell they're doing on their end. And plus I had all the internal cameras were hard-coded with specific IP addresses in the 10 range, 10.0.1. And their router was on 192.168. So when he did bridge mode, all of a sudden all the traffic's 192.168, and the cameras are all missing now. Because they're listening for 10.0, and that network doesn't even provide, isn't even there There's anymore. Not a clash between the two routers. Well, no, that's why he said his router is bridge mode only. It was no longer being a router. It literally was just a switch. But when you, when you switched it, when I switched it back to being a router, now what happens is their traffic on 192.168 hits his router external port, then it does that, and it works fine. So I turned it on, and everything started working. He's like, why did you do that? I'm like, because they're stupid. Because they were literally hired just to make it work, but they didn't take into account his use case. Why did he do it this way? Well, there was a reason we did it this way. Uh, so this is a, they deal strictly with defined parameters. Again, they only do what you're being told to do. Okay. Uh, it says, your computers are prone to programming errors. Obviously, there's always, we talked about the Surface 4 with the update. Obviously, that was a programming error. Okay. So, designed to function within limits of hardware capacity. You know, with techno, you know, we know, you know what Moore's Law is. Every 18 months, process speed basically doubles. It's really the amount of transistors. But, 
think a computer is getting twice as fast every 18 months. So if your connectivity device is five years old, yet you've been upgrading your phone, you've been updating your laptop, and now you're using a, a router that you've had since, you know, 2002. Yeah, it's not going to work. You kind of have to upgrade all of it. Okay? I mean, you don't have to, but... Yeah. It's recommended. Yes. How about the bottom one? Is that they're designed, implemented, and configured by people and are subject to human error. We all make errors. You know, I made an AS assignment for, for cryptography, and I had to enter it was like 684 entries manually by hand that I had to... Read over here and type into here. What's the odds I did all 684 correct? No, very odds. The odds are low. <laughs> so as students get them wrong, I go back and check. Aha, so what I did is, that's why I like it when some students work ahead. Aha, that was an error, and I can go back and fix it so the rest of you don't get the error. But whenever I waste the last minute, then I'm kind of screwed. But, uh, yeah, human error is a big deal. We're all prone to it. Okay, administrative challenge. How about training? Okay. You know, McDonald's, oh, bad, bad idea with McDonald's here. They are test, testing something new in Missouri. All-you-can-eat fries. What? Oh, my God. <laughs> I love McDonald's fries. They are, they get, forget it. I'm going to gain 600 pounds. Please don't get that here. Okay. <laughs> um, but McDonald's has a 600% turnover rate. Did you know that? 600. That means every employee at McDonald's, that position is swapped out six times a year. How much training do you think we get there? Little to none. Just enough to get by. And, uh, and, and a lot of times, I mean, you get training, then you leave. I mean, it sucks, but that's the way life is, okay? Uh, uniqueness, uh, you know, uh, just because I set up firewall for company A, is the same configuration going to work for company B? Probably not. Always that guy sitting on my friend's network didn't take into his unique needs. If you just left the damn router alone, if he literally had not touched the router, we would have been fine. But no, he had to go in and screw with some shit. Okay. Because so I asked him, because I don't know, he was interchanging all kinds of stuff with me. Oh, why? Okay. Responsibility. Um, you know, who's in charge of it, first of all? You know, who takes care of it? Administration. Who, yeah, who does update? I mean, who was allowed, you know, just because I want to add something to the router now, should I be allowed to or should we think about it and make sure it's correct? That's always a good idea. Recommended practices is all traffic from the trusted network is allowed out. That's not good. What they're talking about there. So from inside of Rose State, we should let all outbound traffic go. Is that good or bad? No. no. Well, that's the best practice right there. Okay? The problem is, then if we get some malicious traffic in here, say we get a, a bad guy inside of Rose State, they could be attacking the world through Rose State. So it's not necessarily a good idea. Exactly. Yeah. It's like we don't allow email traffic out. We allow it to our mail server, then the mail server can go out. So we don't want people spamming from inside a row state. Okay, the firewall device is never accessible directly from the public network. You should not be able to log into the router from the outside. Because then people could screw with it. You want to be able to configure it from the inside only. SMTP data is allowed to pass through the firewall and route it to an SMT gateway to filter. In other words, if you can send out mail, it needs to go through some area that's going to filter it. Hopefully look for bad stuff. All right. Uh, all ICMP data is defined. Really, ICMP, that's ping. Really is not needed anymore through a router. You shouldn't really be allowing it. Okay. Telnet, emulation access to all internet providers is blocked. Telnet is so unsecure. Totally wide open. You really shouldn't be using should be using SSH. Okay. Uh, when web services are offered outside the firewall, it should be trapped to prevent it from reaching your internal network. You should not allow people from the outside into your inside with a web browser. They should have to go through some firewall, DMZ, or something. You shouldn't have a... Like me, at my house, I have a direct link into my solar system. Not, people say you have... No, my solar energy production yeah. system. You know, but again, I manage it. It is going through somewhat of a filter, not very much of one. But okay. Trojan detections and preventive systems. We look for bad stuff happening. We can sound an alarm. You know, uh, I learned a lot about these when I was gone this last week. The way an IDS normally works is it senses something bad and reports it. Okay. 
But like we talked about, so so someone's trying to break into my house. They unlock the gar- they open the door, and the alarm goes off. But again, I still don't know what they did before that. Were they looking in the windows? Were they climbing on the roof? Well, this guy that taught my class, he's part owner in a company that they developed an application that records traffic, all traffic, for 10 minutes. So basically it overwrites it after 10 minutes. So whenever there is an event, it can roll back 10 minutes and save it. So now you can see what really happened. Okay, we know he opened the door and set the alarm off, but what was he doing the 10 minutes prior to setting the alarm off? Which is very important when it comes to network intrusion, because yeah, you know they broke in, but how did they get in? Normally they do a lot of stuff before it actually goes off, so that was an amazing system they have. It's gotta be expensive, it's gotta be. Okay. So this can be configured to mon- uh, notify people something goes off. I used to have a temperature uh, sensor in my server room that would send me text messages and emails whenever uh, the temperature got too high. It was funny, I was out there working in the yard one day and in the shed, and I got a text message saying the server room's getting hot. I'm like, what? Well, what I'd done was I plugged in an air compressor and I popped a circuit breaker for the circuit going to the air conditioner in my server room. So if I had not got that message, the server room would have got darn toasty. <laughs> well, actually, it was getting toasty. So I could very easily go in and figure out what's going on. So yeah, they can notify people, but they do require complex configurations. You don't, you know, configuring this stuff is bad. Like when I took care of, when I had my ISP, I took care of Chapel Supply. They sell pressure washers and cleaning equipment. Normally, I would not allow any email to China and the Asia Pacific because there's a lot of crap coming from over there. But they sold pressure washers to China. So could I block China? No. I mean, if you, if you got customers there... Rose State's student email used to be hosted in Amsterdam, the RIPE network, the number one spam-producing network in the world. So what do you think happens when students try to email people? Blocked. Yeah, because it was coming from Amsterdam, which was stupid. Okay. So configuring them correctly is tough. Okay. All right, systems that include intrusion attempt to prevent an attack from succeeding by one, by stopping it. Okay could stop your session, it could be changing the environment, it could do all kinds of things. Change, uh, changing the content to make sure it doesn't have anything in it, so I could tinker if you go to a website with Flash on it. It's not that it's really something bad happening, but they block Flash to make, if it was bad, it would now be benign. It's now, it's been inoculated. That website, which now it doesn't work, <laughs> but... Isn't Flash like a well-known uh, Yeah. Tons of vulnerabilities is what it is. It's like Java, same way. Yeah, you know, there's so many. You know, I always ask the question, can you write bug-free code? No. Yeah. I mean, you can write Hello World. Pretty much one line of code for the most part. So how could you possibly screw that up? But can you guarantee it's going to run on every operating system at all times, you know, with whatever you can't? So... You know, my car, I was actually driving up north of Tulsa a few months back, and all of a sudden, the display totally froze. Oh, crap. I'm literally, speedometer, everything totally froze. I'm like, this isn't good. And the car wouldn't shut off. You know, I was pulled over and stopped. The car wouldn't shut off. So I did the whole, you know, I figured it was just, it's a computer. It's, my car's electric. So I just held the power button for 10 seconds. Brrr, car went off. Left it off about 30 seconds and started it right back up. So we were good. You know, but, uh, <laughs> okay, yeah. now that makes me scared. I have to well, the problem is you don't know exactly what caused it. Okay? You don't, and you'll never know. Because there's too much. I mean. At least the combustion engine is. No, your combustion engine could have the same issue. Oh, yeah. You can have it installed for whatever reason. Again, my car didn't lock up right on the road. I mean, I still was able to drive it just fine. I just couldn't see on the display. Display was frozen. So, I mean, it can happen with anything. And, you know, when you get more electric stuff, yeah, it's like my car, when I steer, hit the gas pedal, none of that mechanical. is mechanical anymore. It's all electric. So, you know, in the older cars, you know, you turn the steering wheel, it actually, turn, no, you don't do that anymore. So, it's a, uh, it was tough. You really don't know what's going on anymore. Okay. Host intrusion detection. Basically, the same thing we just talked about, but on my host. It's right here on my computer, okay? 
can be on multiple computers, but yeah, it basically monitors the computer. Network-based, it's on the network. We've got to finish this up. Uh, we're only halfway through, believe it or not. Uh, network intrusion-based, it's on a network. It can actually tap network traffic and see what's going on there. You can read more about these in depth if you want. Signature-based, now we're looking for signatures. Okay. A signature is a specific code for a virus. Think about it. We can't block that virus until we know about that virus. So we don't know about it until we know the signature of it. Okay. Anomaly-based, we look for something weird. Maybe our traffic at uh, noon today should be at, you know, whatever. I don't even know what, what our traffic would be. But all of a sudden, there's a big spike in some sort of traffic. All of a sudden, email traffic on Rose State went from, you know, 100 emails an hour to 20,000 emails an hour. Obviously, there's an issue. So we're looking for an anomaly, okay? Also known as behavioral base or statistical base. So if you think about it, you pretty much do the same stuff all the time, okay? Okay, it must be uh, technical knowledge and adequate business and security. You must know what the heck you're doing to set this stuff up. Okay, I got to go. Oh, at the bottom, talk about sensors and agents. You can have sensors on your network to look for certain things. To be best, you would really want to have a sensor on every segment of your network, but that's kind of unrealistic. That doesn't get done much. Okay. Remote access protection, war dial, are not used much anymore. Do you all remember war games? Want to play tic-tac-toe? Uh, basically, <laughs> you're looking, you're calling all these phone lines. When I was in Tulsa, we were actually hired from the OU Health Science Center. Believe it or not, did you know the OU, OU Health Science Center is not affiliated with OU in any way whatsoever? Not owned by them, not operated by them, not even included. To them. It just named it. Really? Yeah, I was over there recently with a Virginia for a medical procedure. I'll be darned. It a little says, this is not affiliated with any way whatsoever with Oklahoma University. It's not operated by, funded by, or not even a part of it whatsoever. I didn't either. I was like, seriously? That's misleading. But we were hired to do a uh, pen test on their network. And since I lived in Oklahoma and I came here on weekends, because I'm, I'm, you know, a lot of people lived in Tulsa. I live in Oklahoma City. I was going to do the war dial part of it to check their phone lines. The day before, they canceled that part because they were worried because they gave us a block of numbers. But a lot of those numbers would be to internal patient rooms. And they didn't want us waking up all patients. I understand. You know, yeah, you don't particularly want every phone in the entire building going off and people freaking out, so we didn't do that part. Okay. But yeah, so war dong. Uh, radius, remote access dial and user service. That's, think about your old dial-up ISPs or maybe your VPN connections. You're going to go, it's, it's a way to authenticate us, okay? Terminal access control, I, this name gets me, terminal access control access control system. Doesn't that, why twice? Why not terminal access control system? But no, that's what they call it. But it, same type of system. It's an authorization system, client server based, centralized database, okay? The name key always kills me. Okay, how many dial-up connections should, you know, Rose State used to offer free dial-up. I think Arlene was the very last person to actually use the free dial-up on campus because she wouldn't pay for it. She said, oh, hell no. <laughs> and then she finally upgraded. And then she finally upgraded. She's like, what have I been missing? <laughs> yeah, she's like, wow, this is amazing. <laughs> so, yeah, they found, and they still, as of a couple of years ago, still had the dial-in enrolling classes. Where you, I don't know if they still do because they said, yeah, people are still using it. I'm like, really? Really? Okay. Hopefully callbacks, what that means is you would dial into the system, it would call you back. Could be at a predefined number or one you specify, but a lot of different connection ways to do it. Footprint. Basically, it says the wireless network in the geographical area where you have a significant strength. So basically inside of our buildings. But is there wireless access at the soccer field? I don't know. I've never tried, but, you know. We're driving. I'm going to go around and look for on that. No, it doesn't go. The yeah. wireless doesn't go up that far. It doesn't even go up that far into the yeah, which is good. Like which is kind of good. Do we really need to provide it to neighborhoods? Okay, we're driving. Look around for unsecured networks, web, wired equivalency. It's it's. I for a long time we always thought it was wired um, encryption protocol. It's not. It's equivalency protocol. The initial attempt was to make it so a wireless network was as secure as a wire. Failed miserably. Can be broken instantly now. Now we use WPA and WPA2, which is much better. That's the standard right now. Okay. Why Max? We're all going to get wireless everywhere, provided by Google and everybody else. Uh, Bluetooth, you all know what that is. It's used for lots of stuff nowadays. Okay. 
Port scanners, we're going to look for vulnerability or ports that are open. Uh, we do a lot of demos in that in other classes. And not just ports, now we're actually going to look for vulnerabilities. Hey, you got this port open. Is this problem on that port? Is it not secured? Packet sniffer, that's like Wireshark. We can look at our network traffic, see what's going on. Okay. Content filters, you can no longer search for the word boobs. <laughs> um, yeah. Someone didn't hear the first part of that conversation. like, what? Okay. <laughs> trap and trace. So now we're going to try to trap individuals that are doing illegal activities, maybe getting them into an internal machine known as a honeypot that looks like it's bad, but really those are hard to manage. Okay. Drawbacks. Uh, says, um, I like the bottom one. You get what you pay for. Wireshark is free. It's great, but it's free. <laughs> if you get something that's free, it's normally limited in some way. Nothing in the world is free. If everything was free, then we'd have Bernie Sanders. So there you go. <laughs> uh, okay. <laughs> okay. Okay, drawbacks, using scanners, content filters, you know, again, boobs. Okay, so roast state, all of a sudden we're going to block boobs. Wait a minute, we got a health science department. Guess what? They talk about boobs. There you go, we're dead. Okay, let's block something. Oh, wait, we can't, because we got this other. No, we can't. So it's really, it's tough. What do you, and it really has to be decided way above our level. So, okay. But it's, you got to configure all that stuff. Okay, cryptography, we have an entire course on it. It's encryption. Okay? Cryptanalysis, can, you know, analyzing plain text and cryptic text. Substitution, fire. we do have an entire course on this, so you're going to all take it, so you all have to do it anyway, but we cover all these, and we're running out of time anyway, so we cover all this stuff. Literally, we do we cover all this stuff. Yes, we even cover symmetric, and a symmetric, same key, or secret key system. Okay, No one's had cryptography yet, have they? I don't know. You have? So you have a clue what some of this stuff is then. Okay. Symmetric, same key. We use the same key to encrypt and decrypt. Key management is an issue. A lot of problems with it. Asymmetric is kind of like PGP. Two different keys. I encrypt with one, decrypt with another. It's called the public key encryption system. Actually works really good. Digital signatures. I haven't this year or last year, but in the past I followed my taxes online. I've had identity theft. Can't do it anymore, or at least for a while. But digital signatures is a way, you know, I signed the contract for my solar system onto my computer system. I never actually used a pen. That's where we're going. More and more stuff's going to be that way. Okay? Digital certificate at the bottom, that's how we make sure our websites are where they're supposed to be. RSA, Ravesh, Shamir, and Alderman. Public key encryption system works very well. And it's very popular. still used to this day. PKI, public key infrastructure way of securing our network. Okay? And you'll learn all this stuff in another class, so I don't really think I'm just skipping it. Okay. All right. Authentication, integrity, confidentiality, authorization, and non-repudiation. I think you've heard about most of those. One thing you probably haven't heard much about is non-repudiation. What that means is you cannot say that you didn't do it. Hey, your login did this. So unless I gave my login out, there's no way of doing, well, getting around that. Okay. Non-repudiation. Hybrid, you really don't have strictly asymmetric or symmetric anymore. A lot of times we have like a symmetric system like AES, but we use Diffie-Hellman, which is a key exchange protocol, to exchange that symmetric key to both ends. Okay, so that's really what a hybrid system is. All right, uh, we use them to encrypt stuff. We all buy stuff online. You all know by being an Oklahoma resident, you now have to claim every bit of stuff you buy online and pay taxes on it. I bought nothing online last year. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that is a question now. Did y'all see that? No. You do. You have to, on your Oklahoma state taxes, You it asks the question, how much have you purchased online? So. And you have to pay taxes on it now. Yeah, they want you to go to the website and write them a check, basically. Exactly. <laughs> okay. Email security. PGP is probably the best one. We got SMIME. We got BM. The way is encrypting email. Set. I crossed it out. Good idea. Used a little bit in Europe, not used at all anymore. SSL we are using. SHTTP, kind of the same thing. Secure cycle later using SSL. Uh, SSH, secure shell, is a great version of telling that, tell that it actually works. IPsec, IP security is used along with our SSL. It's used with our VPNs. It's using with all kinds of stuff. 
couple of different modes to make this stuff work. Transport mode and tunnel mode. I'm going to just touch on those for a second. That way when you take the, some of the stuff, we'll remember. Transport mode. Okay. I see trucks leaving Tinker Air Force Base all day long going somewhere. All these different trucks so I can count them. I don't know what's in the trucks, but I know there's trucks going. That's transport mode. Tunnel mode is there's a connection between Tinker and the airport. I can't see nothing. All I know is there's a connection. I don't know if anything's going through it. I don't know. I can't count the vehicles. All I know is they have a connection. So two different modes. They're both good. Except transport mode, I can count the trucks. I know there's data. I just can't tell you what it is. Okay. So VPN, virtual private network, allows you to connect into a secure network from an unsecured network. Across the public insecure network. Okay. Like from your house. Kerberos, that's what we use here to log in. And Windows system. It's really a two headed dog. It actually uses a three way system. Three headed dog. Yeah, server. Three, three headed dog, yeah. It actually uses authentication server, a distribution server, and a ticket granting server. I log in, I get a ticket. Whenever I want access to network resources, Kyle says, hey, let me check your ticket. So see if I have access to something. But it actually authenticates both ways. So really authenticates, say I'm going to access our file server. It authenticates, can do it to the file server but also authenticates the file server to Ken Dewey. So I know it's really the file server, and it knows it's really me, then we can get in and do our business. Okay, a little more about Kerberos there. Uh, don't lose your keys. Okay, yeah, that's about managing stuff. I think we pretty much talked about all that. Okay, it's the end of that lecture. Very long lecture. Uh, let me stop this real quick.